Hello and welcome to CoBytes, sponsored by Search 5.0. And on today's episode, we're pleased to welcome Dastan Shikanev to the podcast. Dastan is currently Senior Payments, Technology and Strategy in Marks & Spencer, where he's playing a key role in leading the modernization of the omnichannel fintech capabilities within this business. On CoBytes, we always enjoy hearing about the very background with our guests. Dastan is no different. He's worked in different sectors, such as 5G network and telecoms, successful career in oil and gas, and then he transitioned into the world of technology, working on some key platforms. We get a good overview of Dastan's drivers, the power of mentorship, the market in general, and advice to any aspiring technologist in today's market. This is a really interesting conversation and I hope you enjoy. Dasan, thank you very much for coming on Copites. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. It's a pleasure to join your podcast and yeah, just to talk and to share what I have from my so far life experience or life journey. So. Yeah. And you have bags of experience <laughs> to ask them, which we're looking forward to exploring. We typically kick this off, Dastan, and would love for you to give our audience an overview of your career and then I suppose how you ended up into the world of technology. Yeah. So I think my corporate world started actually when I was like five, six years old. I was visiting my dad's office constantly. And I, I think I got used to already this corporate stuff. So I didn't have this fear of any, I don't know, anything from that age, actually. And he was taking me to like to meetings of the, the in a corporate level or any level. So it was, I think, put a stamp on me. And I've started working since my school years. My first role was in movie industry. I've done movies in the past theater. So it was school years. And then after high school, I went into oil and gas because of my passion since my childhood. I come from Kazakhstan and we have plenty of oil. So that's natural progression for many of people. So I started in oil and gas. I've done a lot of oil and gas in upstream, midstream and downstream. A lot of projects, commercial, very physical, on the base type of situations, lots of challenges. And yeah, I've seen a lot of tough situations when like physical, you are there. We're talking about the weather. The weather is there in the summer. It is plus 40 plus the sand and everything. And you are with the whole thing. So yeah, it's, I've seen the oil and gas industry. And then I, 2016, there was a huge crisis. There was a drop in oil and gas prices. And then we basically, as an industry, didn't recover since then. It, it was just like big layoffs. So the current layoffs in the tech is just a smaller part of what happened in the oil industry. And I think structurally didn't recover. So at that time I was deciding, okay, this is not going anywhere and I have to change. So I, I consciously took a decision to go into technology because I saw the upside at that time. And then I was lucky enough to be invited to join the bank as the product manager in digital transformation. So I've started FinTech around seven years ago. And since then it, it's been a very good journey for me. I've seen the FinTech from 360 view almost now. And in between that, I managed to squeeze in my master's in, in finance in France and then some telco, 5G, quite a strategic investment part as well. So, and so far for the last one year, I've been working with MNS to help them to improve their embedded finance fintech abilities in a strategic positioning in terms of in the longer, because you've seen a lot of companies are going down. It's one of the things is payments. You don't have good payments online, you're just missing out on money. So yeah, there are lots of work to do, but I'm quite enjoying the whole process. It's always a process. So mm -hmm. that's very like a condensed version, but I can do the whole another podcast probably on just what I've done. <laughs> Sorry. Fast on. I believe it because for any viewers listening or watching, just jumping on your LinkedIn profile, Dastan, I think will give you a good overview of the absolute variation of work that you've done, which is absolutely super. And it's probably a point which I want to touch upon because I think you said a good example, because a lot of occasions, technologists end up very comfortable, perhaps, and maybe have a little bit of fear 
to step into the unknown if they like. But I think you're a good example of, I think, stepping into your stretch zone and trying something different. What advice would you have to any technologist feeling comfortable and with fear of actually moving and trying something new? I think I, I was quite lucky not to start from technology, but start from the like a real life, more tangible part of the corporate world or like works. Because I think the biggest disadvantage, or I would say that what creates the whole fear is the whole IT or computer world is a bit, bit too straightforward and too linear in terms of it's binary sometimes. So you code, you think in a binary terms, then this creates this whole neural, I think, link in your brain that there is a binary things around you. So your world construct becomes a bit your part of the, you work in you know, IT and then that creates the whole world vision of you. And that creates a lot of uncertainties. And so your thinking changes with your profession. So the, it's the, just like full cycle. You've managed to become what you work. And I had a lot of challenges in terms of mental. And I think what I did was I had like very tough periods, but my life motto is life is a sinusoid. So sinusoid is go always going up and down. There is, if you're in the, in one line or just going up, that's quite bad for you. So you should be able to recalibrate, go down, have a step back. That's how your body works basically. So I think the fear of stepping out of to something new, there shouldn't be fear because as long as you're comfortable with your skills, which are core skills, not like the industry skills or knowledge, then there, yeah, of course, you'll have tough time, but that's, that makes you even better person. And for that, I think you need probably a good mentor or the person in my case, I like to call them the mentors because mentors are like a very caring, like mom, but the mentors, they push you even more. So you don't feel relaxed. I think we need more the mentors than mentors because the mentors, they bring out the best of you. Mentors are good, but they are a bit softer than the mentors. So I think that, that I had a lot of the mentors in my life. So that helped me a lot as well. Yeah. And part of a key story that we like to get across in this podcast is the power of mentorship and I suppose the significance of having a good mentor in your career and what that can do for you in your career. Give us an example. Has there been a standout for you, Das, and somebody that's led and guided you as a mentor throughout your career? I, so just a quick step back on mentorship and how I see mentorship overall. So I, I was quite lucky to have a lot of coaches, mentors, because I've done professional swimming, professional alpinism. So there, they influenced me quite heavily. And my first mentor is probably my mom and dad. They influenced me a lot, like the core base of who I am. But those sport coaches or mentors gave me a lot of strengths, mental strengths as well, since the young age. But then like I started looking at mentorship or coaching in a different way. So I would take any person who I'm in a more or less more contact on a frequent base as a mentor. So it can be a person who is younger than me or older than me. And I take them as a distributed mentorship rather than one person is mentoring me because there is, you take different things basically from that. But I can say a lot of my professors were highly influential in terms of becoming more resilient as well. I take mentorship a lot from this guy called Jimmy Yovin. So I haven't met him, but I met the guys around him, but I listened to him. He's just one of the the greatest music producers. So I like his quote about the fear, how to you should monetize fear for your own self rather than being just putting it out. So fear is a beautiful thing if you can manage it. So I use my fear to give me strength rather than sucking out the energy. So I take a lot of advices from different high profile, accomplished people, and I take them as a mentors, basically, even if I haven't met them. So I take this distributed mentorship, I don't know, framework, how you call it, but I have my family is my probably core and I have people who I just go back. It is university, it is coaches of my sports, as well as the current, I'm working with some 
industry leading executives just on a personal basis there is no formal mentorship but we just like to have this kind of informal discussions i think that's how i look at it but when i do mentoring i try to give that person as much of the life experience vision you don't have to teach the tactics you have to give them how to manage yourself and i think you touched on a good point there dastan because we're living in a world of social media of accessible devices and content and you're right a mentor doesn't have to be somebody who you're close with and close contact with it could be an author it could be a podcast host it could be any sort of content that's there to guide you and resonates with you more importantly dasan so i think that's quite a good thing to take away from this yeah i listen to a lot of podcasts in terms of if i find that person like i'm just having the same wavelengths basically i try to just dig in into that rabbit hole of that person and then just to find a lot of things what that person does and then that gives us so much insight you don't have to pay sometimes a lot of money just for you to be mentor you can just be more research but i think for that you have to know what you want that's the biggest challenge for a lot of people what you want and that should be the core question you can answer only yeah for sure and if you were to reflect on your career so far and i know there's been lots but what do you feel has been your greatest success my greatest success is when i would jump into the project there is no i can't say the, the name of the projects but it is it was when i just jumped into the projects without knowing much of that scale i think it links back to being afraid to step out of your comfort zone to something so i was given this project and then they would just straight away jump into that without thinking oh what's going to happen so and then you start discovering while you are on that project and but it creates of this scale of adapting so quickly and seeing the information flow in a different way while you start the more you read the fear start getting away on you like the scale or uncertainty of finishing it so i think that was the biggest success of jumping into multiple projects without knowing like really what's going to happen but i was quite successful in one of them is creating the whole core banking platform for the bank and then subsequently the whole mobile banking app as well as i think the biggest success is probably creating this cards for juniors so for that mobile app you can go as a parent and create a, a card for your i think under the legal age child which they can spend but you put like a spent limit but at least you can see where they're spending and then the places they're going to so that was a that was i think quite exclusive if i say 6 7 years ago and then now it's i think it's i what i see is it's becoming more popular in the world but i would say that was quite innovative at that time and it considered to be a huge success for that time and you touched on a good topic there dastan because i think naturally people can tend to do a lot of due diligence read a lot of content that will actually put them off actually jumping in to something whereas you've been actually the opposite dastan you have just stepped in and just got stuck in basically has there been an ever a time where you think wow <laughs> like this is big has there been ever a time you felt like that or has it been something which you've just taken in your steps day by day Yeah, I had a couple of projects. I think one of them was 5G when I was working. I realized the scope just a bit down the line when we seen it, but it wasn't that it was overwhelming me or I felt down like under accomplishing. It was this the whole scale of that capabilities of that project in the longer term. So I think what I saw at that time was like I wanted to do in a like a very short period of some of the things but then i what i did was i could recalibrate and then to reapproach to that thing in a more pragmatic way and then to be more so if i thought oh i'm going to develop this platform for tablet gaming or cloud gaming now i think the skill is to recalibrate and to change your approach okay we won't finish it but we can shape the whole long term strategy of how this is going to work 
the same with some other prototype secret projects, which we knew that we couldn't finish, but like we knew we would shape the whole industry in terms of the scale. It's worldwide. It's, it is quite huge. And then you understand that, okay, you're not going to do it like in the next two years or is in five years. It's a huge 10 year project probably. So that gives you a good reapproach skill probably. And then I think it, I think the problem was a lot of people, they want to finish some things and then you don't have to finish something. It's, it's this seeing the bigger picture and then changing your approach and being more smarter in your energy, I don't know, efficiency than just becoming over, overburned with all of that mass of the whole project. So I think that taught me a lot of lesson as well. So nowadays I just go in, but I quickly start to change my approach if there, if I see the scale or if there is an affordability of that being accomplished due to different components out of my reach, you should be realistic, right? And then no, no need to torment yourself, the stakeholders, everyone it should be quite realistic. And then from that, you start building strategic long-term things. A lot of people get bogged down to the details. And it's, it's, it's this human nature of getting to the details as I'm seeing the, this bigger thing overall. Yeah, it's just combining that knowledge and awareness and, and taking that initial pressure off and it's the long term and it will veer in different directions. I think that came to me because of my background in alpinism. So in alpinism, you go up in a high altitude and you're going to 5,000, 6,000 meters. Snow, bad weather. So there is a golden rule in alpinism. If you didn't reach your like destination by 1 p.m., it doesn't matter you are the greatest ever, you are the starter. If you didn't reach that one by 1 p.m., you should go back straight away from that place. You just see 1, 1 p.m., I'm, I'm at 5,800, and then this is like 200 meters left. 1 p.m., you go back. So that, that gives you this hard stop mentality, basically, because those 200 meters can be quite detrimental to your life and that can kill you actually. So that is the rule everyone follows. If I mean, I have, I had amazing coaches, which are world-class alpinists and they always do follow that thing. So that's like the golden rule. That's that I think helped me a lot. Like you shouldn't overdo that because this, there is a risk. So I think that helped me to transfer that skill into corporate world. Yeah, that creates discipline and we see it where technologists can work crazy hours which could potentially result in burnout but if they're able to apply something which you've done an alchemist level and put it into their day-to-day -day, it helps for productivity managing stress recalibration so i love that i want to talk to you about the industry as a whole currently and what do you feel is a current challenge that we're facing so uh, i i was talking yesterday at an event and then there was this what are your reflections from year to date and my reflection is that there is a huge burnout in a corporate like technology world everywhere and i notice it like i work with service providers and it's like the whole trend is there is a burnout of human being like the whole every everyone who's in that technology industry it's, it's you can notice it because there is a dip in the services provided. There is a dip in being proactive from their side. And I, I noticed that all over the places, I go to a lot of events and I part of the panel sessions and I notice from people's, even like just casual talking, there, there is like a, such a bad energy of being burned out. And that would affect the whole corporate quality of that company, any company. So I think for me, the biggest, threat is not the AI, but how we burned out will bring so much decline that AI won't help anyone, basically. I'm not worried about AI at all because that's that's not the biggest threat. The biggest threat is how we manage the whole burnout in terms of informational obesity. That's what's killing a lot of this spark of working, basically, I think. And then until we manage that, and I think that there will be a decline of in companies as well. And overall quality of services we will get. I think we've passed that point of being quality driven. And then it's just becoming 
zombified basically that's what i noticed that that's quite unfortunate as well and you add on top of that inflation you mm. have a perfect cocktail now that that is the biggest challenges i think i see from any company's point of view so there's so much pressure and on that front because it's such an important topic I and mean, obviously we care about this industry we want to see people Doing extremely well within their careers, prospering as well. In relation to what you had mentioned, that's down to employers and companies to manage that. What do you think they could be doing to reduce and manage the stress and potential burnout? I can actually do a whole uh, whole podcast about this. I'm sure, yeah. I'm sure. This is a very passionate topic to me because how. I think my, we can easily call 95% of all industry, the companies, they still operate in industrial age pattern, right? So they treat a person as a unit of uh, assembly line. So I know like in a large companies, it is quite difficult to manage the thing, but my challenge is organizational management is moved on so much further. And then we, as our life components, we're so much informational cyborgs basically as a human being but we still need to operate in a very rigid corporate way where you have to turn up at certain hours and then you should do this and you should do that there is there is a huge challenge for companies to enable the talent that person has so i think there is an underutilization of the talent from anywhere so basically people are just being re reduced to doing very automated non-thinking word what i've noticed like it's the same pattern of speech and everything there is no taking the whole 100 percent of that person's talent i think the challenge would be how would you do that i think the some startups can do that because they have more nimble smaller teams and then they interact the ceo is approachable or they can do more flexible and but i think the biggest threat is a lot of companies still operate with that old school mentality and old school mentality doesn't live with the current lifestyle. So that that's the biggest challenge. I think there, the AI is not, the, it's not the threat. The threat is changing that. Once we change that AI is going to be helping us everywhere, but we now face with fear mongering of, oh, AI is going to destroy everyone. Come on. The whole organizational structure is destroying everyone, not the AI. So yeah, that, that would my thought. It's very much a change in the traditional mindset, which will then yeah. help embrace emerging technologies such as AI, which obviously there's a huge spotlight on. And you touched upon talent there. I'm keen to learn from your point of view when recruiting, how would you identify good talent in today's market? And then how would you retain talent? I don't ask probably typical testing questions in terms of I, my approach would be to uncover that any, anyone who would be interested to join my team is what is that person's total potential not being within my remit, but what is that person's total potential? If you can see that the whole transferable skills, the philosophy, the life journey behind that person, you'll see it from the just casual talk in a relaxed mode, that would give you the whole picture rather than, okay, you're applying for this product manager in data. Just give me this. You're already making that person redundant for that person. And then you don't, you're not seeing what is, what that person can bring. And that is one thing, but also that brings the whole of think cognitive diversity of, I think where the background, what they've been doing, what their mother and father were doing and how that influences their thinking patterns and everything. And what I notice is it is redundant HR practices, redundant line managers just doing what they want to see. It's just because that means they couldn't care less. So my practice is to see the total talent potential. And then from there, you can actually teach that person what to do in the technical terms. That's tactical. You can do it in two, three months. That's probation period four. If that person is in that period, you mean, he excels or she excels then that means there is something and then you should how you nurture or how to retain it is you should give that person to be express themselves in a i mean in 
ideas in not to shut down. I, I see a lot of, from peers, a lot of micromanagement in terms of cognitive micromanagement. Like you shouldn't think that way. You shouldn't go to that area of thinking even. Like you can't do that. Just total freedom. Do they want? And then you'll see they will, you don't have to manage them. You should give them framework of what do you want. I think one of the best practices in the world is, I think, the Four Seasons Hotel Group. They have the less churn in the on their employers. I mean that that's that means the entry door is quite good, and then the filter is quite good, and then they don't have to leave on the back door. Then realize that if you read about these four seasons practices, it's fascinating how they have managed to master that thing for everyone, from waiters, from everyone, like the whole level. <laughs> wow. Yeah. And you know what? There's so much to be taken from the hospitality sector as well, like the Ritz, for example, with customer experience and everything like that now. So it's a good example. So I think from that, there's so much with regards to hiring on potential and hiring on character and then giving them the freedom and the autonomy to be creative, be innovative and not micromanage and have no blockers. I'm keen to learn, we spoke about the challenges and the sectors and spoke about embracing technology what would be your advice to any aspiring technologist in today's market just with all of the noise that's circulating we spoke about from burnout mm. to emerging technologies to everything if you're if i'm an aspiring technologist in today's market even perhaps considering my next move what would be your advice i do advisory for c level executives on long term company purpose, business model transformation, how you would call it. So recalibrating some of the business activities into a different streams. Some companies don't. One of them examples is Kodak. So is if a startup or more or less established is, I think, to see the bigger picture strategically, a lot of companies don't see it. They are so preoccupied with operational, how to raise money, how to like all those HR stuff. So I give a parallel with going to gym. So you should be doing gym. I do gym every day. So you should be doing that every day, like going strategic thinking, seeing things on a daily basis. That way you will be more or less aware of where your company is going, basically. Because if you cannot have your future in your hands and giving the whole industry saying, oh, this industry is being disrupted by something, then it means you're just giving your company's flow to someone else. You're not controlling it. So for that to control, you should see the long-term macro bird eye view every day. Not, well, let's do strategic offsite for once a quarter. No, that doesn't work anymore. And that's a very redundant old school thinking. You should be doing it on a daily basis and everyone in your company should be doing it. But for that, it is a whole philosophical change of the mindset. That's where the, a lot of executives board level lack. And that's why we see a lot of companies are failing and th there will be more failures. And I've posted like before the whole tech layoffs, they, this tsunami is coming. And then like maybe one year before that, and you can feel it because there are so many zombie mindsets, basically. I'm not calling anyone zombie, but the whole core thinking is you should be awake every day and it, it's challenging, but that's the only way to survive. And the same goes with your health. If you don't do physical activities, your health is going to decline very quickly. One fact, after 40 years old, you are losing 2% of your muscle every year. Imagine. So if you don't do exercising after your 40s, you're losing muscles and then it just goes quickly so much. It's the same with companies, right? So if you don't do this muscle building, after you mature, you're going to be dying very slowly, but it's going to happen quickly at the end. So my advice would be alert every day. It doesn't mean to burn out, but you have to smart rather than hard. For that, you should be, I think, change some philosophical mindsets of seeing things in a different way. That That's where I advise a lot of those people to see things in a different way. It's, I think, the biggest challenge for many people. And uh, yeah, it's people want to do stuff. You don't have to do stuff. You have to think first more sometimes and then do. So there are like tactics, you how to approach things. Sometimes you have to do it. Sometimes you have to think. So it's quite 
like an interesting thing but if you take if you embrace it as a sport then it will be amazing for you for sure it's consistent repetition and daily awareness i love that this has been a brilliant conversation and i know that we could literally talk for another hour quite easily i think you're very inspiring our first meeting i was absolutely blown away by what you've achieved i'm excited to see the next step but and what that looks like for you if people are wanting to learn more about yourself for instance or how could they go about doing this i'm active on linkedin and twitter so my last name is my twitter handle and my linkedin is dastan shukanayev yeah you can find me and message me if you want i'm quite open person open-minded in terms of talking to different people so yeah that that would don't have any social media those are the two of my places at present yeah excellent perfect well listen dastan has been an exceptional conversation and thank you Thanks. for your time Thanks, Stephen. Thanks for the invite. And it's been a pleasure to share. I think it like I, I can do a lot of topics to cover and then share my thoughts. And I think what you are doing is giving the world some signals what to look at while bringing a lot of guests on different topics. And I think there, are, there, there is a lot of noise, but I think if you can see the signals, it is good. So I'm happy that I was part of your signal show. <laughs> That's what they say. So, yeah. I love that. Perfect. Very positive. Thank you. Thanks, Steve.